Well, Tennessee was invaded by all kinds of people this week, wasn't it? Did you see Nashville, Tennessee this week? Hundreds of thousands of people showed up in downtown Nashville for what? Yeah, the NFL draft. And here's what's amazing. People from all of these NFL teams showed up. And they were all wearing their, their, their jerseys and their, their signs, and they waved banners. I saw the, the good ones were wearing cheese heads on their head, you know. Uh, they were all there. And I watched the NFL draft with a, a little bit of interest, to be honest with you. And I watched the first night, and we all heard a lot of names being called. And then as soon as they'd call the name of the person who was coming to their team, what would all of their fans do? They'd cheer and go crazy. What was most interesting to me is when we got to round two, three, four, five. The fans were still there. The fans were still wearing their jerseys and they still had their pennants waving high in the air. But they'd call out the names of these players. Players no one has ever heard of unless you either went to high school or ate breakfast with these players. And then you'd see the fans of these teams just absolutely go berserk over a player. They have no idea who it is. They have no idea whether the, the player's any good or not. And yet they are screaming their brains out. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be funny if the commissioner would come up, point the cameras on these fans, call out a fake name just one time, and show how these people respond. I'm going to be honest with you. Most of the people who were there were super fans, fanatics of their team. But the truth is, in the midst of their fandom, in the midst of their fanaticism, there was very little substance underneath that fanaticism. They had no idea who the players were. They really didn't even know what their team's needs were. They just heard their team announced and they started screaming and waving their hands. But there was nothing underneath. We're going to start a series this week, and it's going to be a four-week series. It's a short week, four, short four-week series, and it's entitled this, This We Believe. We want to take four weeks to talk about what are those things that are very important to us as Wesleyan Christians, as people who follow Jesus Christ in a unique setting inside of the Wesleyan perspective of the full continuum of Christianity so that when the name of Christ is called and when the time of discipleship is presented, we're not fanatics just simply waving our hands saying, yes, yes, Jesus, Jesus, but have nothing underneath to be a rooted foundation a solid understanding of who we are and what we've been called to be. Now, the truth is this. Our understanding in the United Methodist Church is a large connectional table. We believe that there is primary theology and secondary theology. Primary theology is that theology which saves us. That theology which we must hold in common. Secondary theology is theology that we have beliefs about that are important, but we can see them differently. And that the, the table of grace is this great big large table. And around that table, we can sit and have dialogue with each other and come to new understandings as we engage with the scripture, as our understanding of faith grows, 
so too does our theology and our secondary understanding of theology. Think of it like this. A giant umbrella, and it's raining outside. There is one part of that umbrella that will keep you from getting wet. It is the hood. If you go out simply with a stick in the umbrella, even if it has a great crook handle, and hold it out in the rain, you're going to get wet. The hood is the part of the umbrella that when it rains, keeps you dry. The stick and the handle are important to that umbrella, amen? Because without them, the hood would fly away. The stick is like this secondary theology. It's important because it connects you to the hood. And when the rain comes, it's always accompanied by wind. Therefore, the stick is important because it holds. But the hood is that which keeps you dry. Let me see if I can explain that very briefly. Some people in the United Methodist Church believe that infants should be baptized. Some people in the United Methodist Church believe we should not baptize our infants and we should wait until they come to an age where they can profess their faith for themselves and do adult believer baptism. These are two very differing views and understandings of the practice of baptism. In the United Methodist Church, both are welcome. Both are accepted. Both are received. In the United Methodist Church, we teach that you should baptize your infants. You should baptize your children. However, we believe that all forms of baptism are acceptable and right. And so if you choose to say, well, we'll wait and have our children baptized later in life. This is acceptable, true, righteous, and good inside of our church. Secondary theology. A few weeks ago, if you were here with us, you saw us with the large swimming pool and the big pitcher of water as we baptized four persons into the faith. This is the form called pouring in baptism. The water is scooped up, poured over the head, comes down the body, and experiences the, the, the waters of baptism. Over here is our baptismal font in which we often hold children or stand near adults. And we take that water and we sprinkle it on someone's head. I haven't done it since I've been here at Broad Street, but at many other churches, we have practiced the, the practice of taking persons down to the river and immersing them fully inside of the water and lifting them back up. This is called immersion baptism. I ask you, which one of the three is right? Right? Secondary theology. Important. A large table around which we can dialogue and engage into the scripture. But I'm going to promise you this. There will be people in heaven that were sprinkled. There will be people in heaven that were poured upon. And Lord help us, I promise you, there will be people that were immersed in baptism. Amen? In heaven. Important, but secondary. Augustine actually started this conversation with these words, and, and uh, John Wesley actually kind of perfected them for us. It says this, when it comes to theology... In the essentials, we must have unity. In the non-essentials, we can have liberty. But in all things, we will offer charity. Let me just say that again so it sinks in. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. In all things, what? Charity. So friends, for the next four weeks, we want to have this discussion. This we believe. And today we start 
with this essential of the faith, this understanding of grace and the theology of grace. Now, last week, we gathered and we celebrated this empty tomb, did we not? We gathered together and and celebrated that there were linens that had been laid in that tomb and stripped from the body that was once thought dead, that was dead, but thought to continue to be dead. We celebrated that the stone had been rolled away and that Jesus had been risen from the dead. But there must be implications of that empty tomb. There must be meaning from that empty tomb. There must be that which we believe that is life-altering, life-transforming, and life-changing from that empty tomb. Because if all that it was, was a miracle, if all that it was, was a sign and wonder that that, that amazed people 2,000 years ago, then why do we bother living as Christians? Why do we bother talking about it? Why do we sing songs? Why do we read scriptures? If there aren't implications from the empty tomb, then we've missed the boat completely and totally. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight says it this way. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. You see, the empty tomb points to the work of grace, this substitutionary grace, this saving grace, this justifying grace that God came to earth because he loved us so much that he wanted us to experience what forgiveness was really all about. He wanted us to know what the freedom from sin was really all about. He wanted, to, he wanted us to know what eternity and life with God was all about over and against separation, distance, and abandonment. So today I want to talk about justification that's born out through this gift of grace. Now, justification is a tough word, and we throw it around a lot in the church. And in fact, we even say it sometimes. We read it in some of our, our, our readings and some of our, uh, apostles, some of our creeds and some of these things like that. But we don't really know what justification is. Justification simply means this. To make something that is unright, right. To make something that is unright, right. In, in real simple terms, to bring righteousness to those that are unrighteous. Now, justification in a very deep sense is simply this, that God sent Jesus because he knew that none of us could attain righteousness on our own. In fact, there's an entire Old Testament full of stories and people who tried and worked, succeeded for moments, then failed for significant periods of times, went up and down. God gave them the law through strict obedience that they could be righteous, but every last one of them failed. And so in God's, in God's sight, rightness or oneness with God could not be possible through the law because every one of them failed. I have a news flash for you. In the New Testament era, maybe I should say the Broad Street era, amen? None of us have made it either, amen? Amen. And so God said, I'm going to send my son Jesus to be the justification or the making right of humanity, And this is literally what happens. Humanity, when they receive Jesus, have Jesus' righteousness applied to them. And when God looks at humanity to evaluate righteousness, 
He sees not our disobedience. He sees not our failings. He sees not our errors, our sins, our, our hurts, our habits, our hangups. Instead, he sees Jesus applied to the person, and he says, I see my righteousness in them. And judgment will pass over. If you were with us on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday before Easter, it was the picture that was seen in Egypt when the plague of the death of the firstborn son was prophesied. And God said, now take the, the blood of the ram and put it on the doorposts of your, of your home. And then take yourselves and hide behind the sacrifice that is on the doorway. And when death comes to visit, it will see the sign of justification that has been placed on the doorpost and death will pass over your household. It is the picture for the New Testament understanding of the sacrifice of Christ to bring at one or atonement to humanity. Christ's righteousness applied to our doorposts of our hearts, our minds, and our lives. Death will literally pass us over. And then, when God looks at us, he sees us as righteous. New. A recreation. And everything else is forgiven, redeemed, and put away. Dr. Roy Gustafson helps us with a story that I believe really explains justification. Here's what it says. It seems there was a man in England who was driving a Rolls Royce. That's not a bad situation, amen? He decided to go on holiday across to the continent. So he loaded up on a boat took his car and started enjoying his vacation. While he was driving around Europe, something happened to the motor of his car. He called the Rolls Royce people back in England and asked, I'm having trouble with my car. What do you suggest that I do? The Rolls Royce people flew a mechanic over to the continent of Europe and they sent a mechanic to fix his car. The mechanic repaired the car, flew back to England, and left the man to continue on his holiday. As you can imagine, the fellow was wondering, how much is this going to cost me? So when he got back to England, he wrote a letter to the people and he said, Dear Rolls-Royce Company, you sent a mechanic, you fixed my car while I was in Germany. How much do I need to send you to cover the cost of my broken down car? The next week, he received a letter from the office that simply read, Dear sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything was ever wrong with your Rolls Royce. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, that's the picture of justification, isn't it? This, 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 this gift of life that's given to us by God, intended for beauty and perfection, that, that through original sin and, and our choices and our, our stuff that we do becomes kind of broken and, and we have these hurts, habits, and hangups. But God looks down and he says, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to put my righteousness into it. I'm going to heal that original sin. I'm going to heal those hurts, habits, and hangups. And then I'm going to keep no record of wrongs. You see, this is the problem, I think, and especially in postmodern Christianity. We don't realize that God really means what he promises. We aren't able to accept that gift that's overlaid to us. I want to read again from Romans chapter 3. Just listen to the words. Don't read it in your Bible. In fact, maybe just close your eyes and receive this as kind of the oral tradition of text to you today. Hear these words. God has shown us a different way of being right in his sight. Not by obeying the law, but by the way promised in scriptures long ago, we are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus to take away our sin. 
And we all can be saved in the same way, no matter who we are or what we have done. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Yet now God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. He has done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sin. Friends, it is not because of who you are. You haven't earned a single bit of God's grace. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you give, no matter how much you pray, no matter how many mission trips you go on, it doesn't matter if you're an 80-year member of Broad Street United Methodist Church, there is nothing that you can do. This is all a work of God's righteousness imputed into his people because of who he is and because he loves you. And because he does, he takes away your sin. This requires faith. Faith is really the trusting of God. The believing of God that he really has forgiven your sin. And this has been a struggle all through human history. But we get examples time and and time and time again of people who had faith in God to believe God at his word that he really did love us enough to take our sin from us. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. You remember this man named Abram. He lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. God called him and he said, Abram, you're going to be my son. And I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. And through you, I'm going to bring this story to life so that all the world can know about it. And Abram trusted God. And God brought his righteousness to Abram. He changed his name to Abraham. And then late in life, he starts having a child. And and late in life, this promise starts to come through. But in Genesis 15 and 6, you hear this. Abraham believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed in God. He put his faith in God. He trusted God, and God imputed into him because of his faith righteousness because he believed and trusted in God. Justification is this, a system of making one right with a holy God which doesn't require perfect obedience but rather an honest faith in Jesus Christ as the redemption of our brokenness. This we believe, that God loved us enough to see us in our brokenness and in our brokenness to send his love, his son, to die, to forgive that brokenness and make us right. Now, I said to you that empty tomb has implications, right? Right? Now, I'm going to be done in just a few minutes, but I want to speak very clearly. I want to speak very, very clearly. What are those implications? If all of this is true, and God really has come to forgive us and to set us right, and, and if all of this is really a, the, the free gift of God without any merit on our own behalf, and, and we have to receive this gift through faith in Jesus Christ, and, and, and if this is all really real, then what are those implications? Well, let me share with you just three brief ones. Number one. If you are justified, then you are completely forgiven. If you are justified, then you are completely forgiven. My boys love it when I tell the story about when I was their age, I used to go over to the church. We lived in a parsonage. My dad was the pastor, and we lived immediately in the parking lot of the church. 
What a horrible way to grow up, amen. Uh, but, but, but anyways, I would go over there and I'd take my baseball glove and a little golf ball and I'd throw the ball against the church because it was this great brick wall and the ball would just bounce off and I could work on ground balls and I could throw myself pop flies and, and it was incredible. But, but one day I was throwing the ball and instead of hitting the brick wall, I made a bad throw and it skipped and it went right through this big window in the church. Smashed it. And so I went and told my dad, I said, Dad, a bird just threw, flew through the window and busted the window at the church. And he said, really? Let's go and see if we can help the bird. And I said, okay. Well, I was eight years old and stupid. I forgot to get the golf ball out before I told him. And so we went in there, and, and there was the golf ball and the shattered glass, and my dad looked at me, and he said, are you telling the truth right now, son? And of course, the tears were welling up in my eyes. And I realized at that moment that I could no longer attend that church. I realized that I could no longer play baseball. I'd have to leave my parents' house, get on a train, and move to Mexico. My dad swept up that broken glass. He hugged me and he said, son, I forgive you. I love you. You can still come to church. You can still play baseball. You can still be in my family. That afternoon, my dad went out in that driveway and you know what he did? He took a golf ball in his baseball glove and he started playing on that wall with me. If you are justified, you are forgiven, not partially forgiven, not forgiven for the little stuff, but the big stuff is still there. You are completely and totally forgiven. Also, if you are justified, you have a new righteousness. Now, don't miss the depth of what I'm saying right here. If you are justified, you have a new righteousness. That means that not only is your sin gone, but you have been washed from the inside out, and you are now prepared to be an agent of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are redeemed and set free with a new righteousness for a new purpose. God has a work in your life. In 1923, there was a, a baseball player that played for the New York Yankees. Maybe you've heard of him before, Babe Ruth. Have you heard of him? In 1923, he had the most home runs of anyone in the league. He had the highest batting average of anyone in the league. And he had more strikeouts than anyone else in the league. You want to talk about a confused polarity? That was Babe Ruth in 1923. But do you know what he said? Listen to this quote. He said, I love hitting because when I step into the box, it doesn't matter what happened at my last at bat or what happened before in the game. Even if I struck out, when I step into the box, it's a new at bat with new possibilities. That's the picture of justification. We receive a new righteousness with which we're released into the kingdom to do a new work, to be a new thing, to be a new creation. And I'm going to tell you, the empty tomb and the shadow of the cross have got to point to us that we have to stop buying the lies of darkness and guilt and shame, and we've got to be released to being a new creation for the cause of Christ. I'm going to tell you this, I'll close. If there is any hope in the world, it is Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. Let me just say it again. If there's any hope for this world, it is Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. Do you know the fastest way that that's going to flame, flame, the fans, the flames are going to be fanned all throughout the world? It's through disciples and followers of Jesus Christ who have gone through it. And then receive that gift of redemption and justification and then go out and say to the world, look at I was broken too and God set me free. So Broad Street, 
Where do we go from here? Where do you go from here? This we believe. This we believe. We are new creations. Not of our own accord, but of the gift of the Father. Christ has been applied to our life. His righteousness is ours. And in that, we have hope. I want to pray as we close today. But this is a prayer from Martin Luther, the great reformer from Germany. The one who really started the work and and the movement of the theology of justification. And I pray that his prayer might be yours today. Won't you pray with me? I do not come because my soul is free from sin and pure and holy and worthy of thy grace, dear Lord. I do not speak to you because I've ever justly kept your laws or dared to meet your face. Dear Lord, I know that sin and guilt combine to reign over every thought of mine and turn me from good to evil. I know that when I try to be upright and just and true to thee, Lord, I am still a sinner. I know that often when I strive to keep a spark of love alive for you, Lord, the powers within leap up in an unsubmissive might and often benumb my sense of right and pull me back to sin. Oh, Lord, I know that though in good, doing good, I spend my life, I never could atone for all that I've done. But you, Lord, through you, my sins are black as night, forgiven. I dare to come before you, God, because I trust your son. In him alone, dear Lord, I place my trust. Come boldly to thy throne of grace and there commune with you. Oh, dear Lord, salvation sure. Oh, Lord, is mine. And all unworthy, I am thine. For Jesus died for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.